Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our readers and listeners of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position along with your favorite beverage to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine the show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we want to say thanks for questions coming from our audience at Smith Weekly, including Brent S., Dave V., and Jackie A. Seth Gray has joined us on the show today. Seth is the Chief Executive Officer of Lightbridge Corporation, a nuclear fuel-focused company developing higher-efficiency nuclear fuel solutions that have shown to be better over existing conventional fuel. The company is listed on the NASDAQ under the symbol L-T-B-R. Seth, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. Well, Seth, let's start off by having you give us an overview of your expertise and background. Well, I originally came into nuclear as a lawyer working in high technology international transfer, uh, working exclusively in nuclear for some time, and was attracted to nuclear power for its energy, for its clean air purposes, and just it was very interesting to me dealing uh, internationally in transactions and dealing with other countries. The nuclear power industry, Seth, what is your candid outlook for this form of energy going forward? Well, I think the nuclear power industry is at an inflection point now. I think that domestically it's been very flat. We've had reactors closing while others have increased their efficiency. So the amount of electricity production has stayed pretty pretty constant, even though we've lost some reactors around the world. We're mostly seeing Russia selling new reactors and China gearing up quite substantially to do so. And I think that we're coming to a point where there are going to be new technologies, new approaches that lift this industry up to provide a much greater share of global energy or not. And I think that the way it's going, it's going to succeed. And Lightbridge is very happy to be part of that effort where new technologies for fuels, for reactors, for producing fuels, new technologies for producing reactors themselves differently from how we used to do it. Um, will prove themselves out in the marketplace in the coming years. And Seth, how do you feel with, uh, what are you seeing out there with your conversations to, to industry folks and from a public perception viewpoint, do you see the public is starting to change their tune with regards to things like nuclear and small modular reactors? Um, are they starting to come off this high of wind and solar is the only solution, even though in fact it's not? What's your thoughts on perception these days? Yeah, from what I'm seeing from polling data, particularly from the Nuclear Energy Institute, is that advanced nuclear polls polls well, polls better than nuclear, that carbon-free nuclear polls well, that younger people are more interested in new technologies, including advanced nuclear technologies, and that as long as these innovative, generally smaller companies that are bringing the newer technologies, the safer, more efficient technologies um, can, can succeed in the licensing and in the marketing of their technologies, the public will be there. And part of what's holding back nuclear are the very large costs of deploying large reactors. And I think your mention of small reactors is right on simply because the cost of building them will be much less, and the capital at risk to build them will be much less, and there will be companies willing to, in the end, replace coal plants and other fossil fuel plants with smaller nuclear reactors, companies that could not have considered spending many billions of dollars on, on a large reactor. Well, Seth, I think that's where Lightbridge starts to come in and, and support this this uh, advancing nuclear and, and the future of nuclear. Can you introduce the audience to Lightbridge? Give us a brief overview, and then we'll get into the capital structure and management. At Lightbridge, we had an idea for a new type of fuel technology, new fuel that would work in the existing reactors and in new reactors, including small ones. 
we started out um, also by providing consulting services to bring in revenue to help launch this nuclear fuel effort. And our expert team wrote the strategic plan for nuclear power for the United Arab Emirates. We worked in many other countries. We brought in tens of millions of dollars. We launched Lightbridge um, as a small company on the NASDAQ stock exchange. And we've been developing this technology. We've been patenting it. It's going very well. The technology is designed to improve the safety of the existing reactors or new ones, increase their power output. The fuel lasts longer in reactors. The fuel will prevent the reactors from producing weapons usable materials. This is, as they say in the industry, much more highly proliferation resistant. We think this technology will be very well placed to sell to the existing reactors and for new ones. There are four very large U.S. electric utilities that have nuclear reactors that collectively generate half the nuclear power in the U.S. that are advising Lightbridge, that are helping us make sure that the product that will be produced will be usable for their reactors, for their types of reactors around the world. And we're also working with other companies that are innovative, that are developing smaller reactors and new types of reactors to make sure that our fuel will work in their plants as well. Very well. I, I think that's some, some key points you brought up, um, and we want to talk a little bit more about some of those things you brought up in a moment. Can you share with us a little bit about the key management over at Lightbridge? Why are they important? And then who are the key shareholders backing the company and management at this point? The management at Lightbridge is an excellent team that brings all the skills we need to carry out this effort. Uh, it includes Jim Malone, who's our chief nuclear fuel development officer, who was the vice president of fuel, the head of nuclear fuel for Exelon, the largest owner and operator of nuclear power plants in the United States. And at Exelon, in that role, he was in charge of buying nuclear fuel. Jim brings the view of the customer into Lightbridge, the customer who would be buying our fuel and everything that a large utility needs to see to buy a new nuclear fuel. Jim makes sure we'll be able to provide it. And he's working with our customer base, with the utilities in the U.S. and around the world. We also have John Johnson on our management team. John was a very senior executive at the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission regulating reactors. John understands the entire licensing process, what we have to do to qualify our fuel to deploy it into the marketplace. He's also a licensed oper uh, reactor operator who originally came from the Navy. And John led our regulatory work in the United Arab Emirates and other countries. And John really understands the domestic and global markets. And I could go on with several others. I'll just mention one more, Aaron Totemeyer, who is our nuclear fuel expert, a PhD in nuclear engineering, who leads the design efforts of the fuel. And Seth, for an early stage startup company such as Lightbridge that, is, that has been around, uh, the product's not yet commercially out there um, on a wide scale to be cash flow uh, sustaining. How are you approaching cost control, the general and administrative side, and what is your view of compensation for a company of this size? Yeah, we're, we're very good at containing costs in the company. People at the industry are often amazed at what we're able to do at, at relatively low costs here. These include that we use shared office space in a suite with other companies. These include that we outsource work to laboratories, to universities, to other companies that we partner with. In terms of compensation, all of us here at the company take part of our compensation in equity in the company or in stock options as a form of that equity. And we can only make money on that if the stockholders do, if the investors do. And that also holds down the cash payments in salaries to have some payments in equity. And how many shares are outstanding, Seth? Uh, and how far do you see the cash balance lasting at this point? And what can investors inspect for uh, future financing methods? There are about 
I think almost 39 million shares outstanding in the company. Um, and that was before a one for 12 reverse stock split we did recently. So you would divide that number by 12. The cash balance in the company is about $20 million. We are in a very strong cash position for a company of our size. And we very carefully manage that cash and utilize cash paid by partners and others. And we'll be seeking um, government funding support as well. Okay. And can you tell the audience where you are, Seth, as far as NRC approvals for this new fuel technology? And, and what is the current testing status? A new fuel must go through something of an established process at the NRC. But within that, there's a lot of discretion and um, views of the NRC of exactly what they'll need to see. We're working very closely with the utilities that in the end will be the applicants to the NRC. They'll be the licensees to utilize the fuel. There will be applicants to the NRC to produce the fuel. There'll be applicants to the NRC to transport the fuel and for those shipping casks. And through all of that, we are working with these companies. We've met with the NRC. We've recently had meetings with commissioners of the NRC at headquarters. And we have as clear a view as one can at this point of what needs to be done. And we have experts here and with co companies we're working with on, on carrying that out. And basically, the NRC is a safety organization, that their job is to ensure the safety of the reactors. And so far, all of our testing, all of our computer modeling shows that this fuel will be significantly safer than the safe product that's already out there and licensed by the NRC. And we're very confident of meeting all of the licensing criteria. And Seth, how about the various patent filings? Uh, what has been done here and how important are these patents for the company? The patents are of seminal importance to the company. First of all, by going the patent route, it shows that we own the technology, we invented the technology, we have the economic rights to the benefits from this technology. Secondly, we're very proud of this technology. Most companies in the nuclear power industry deal with their technology through trade secrets, not through patents. We are proud to put this technology out there in the public to allow independent analysis of the technology to validate our claims. And this also helps us with export controls, with technology transfers, that once the patent is issued and there's a national security review within government that allows the patent to be published, we can then transfer that technology. It is publicly available versus trade secrets that, that can be harder to transfer and deal with commercially. Seth, what's your thoughts on, you know, investors want to know when the company can start really getting to that next stage of potentially getting some kind of offtake agreement in place or some kind of, I guess, pre-cash flow situation for the company. When do you see the company taking potential orders and seeing some of that capital come in? Are we five years out? Are we less than that? Where are we at in, in regards to that? Oh, no, I think we're quite a bit less than that. We're going to see fuel produced and demonstrated in reactors in the near term over the coming year. Uh, we're going to be dealing with utilities that will be ordering fuel assemblies for lead test assemblies that will have lead times on those orders, um, including uh, working with the utilities on our nuclear uh, utility fuel advisory board, or NUFAB as we call it. Uh, we've already very recently demonstrated producing full commercial length fuel for the first time to light bridges design using surrogate materials, not uranium enrichment. And uh, we will, uh, in the next few months, for the first time publicly, show these fuel rods and videos of the production of these fuel rods. And Seth, what is the, and I think you alluded to it earlier, what is the approach with clients at this point? Are you approaching or how will, how will the arrangement with the utilities be? Will there be offtakes up front? Uh, will there be just utility direct purchases from Lightbridge, uh, just licensing of the technology? What is the structure that's going to come into play here? 
Well, it can vary in different places. What we are intending to do is is work with companies that together will produce and sell the fuel. And uh, there can also be licenses to, to other places in the world, perhaps, that don't want to buy an export product. But for the most part, we're looking for this fuel to be produced here in the U.S. and exported from the U.S. With regards to New Scale Power, uh, I understand Lightbridge is doing some work with New Scale. What's your thoughts on that company, and what do you think? Where is the potential with SMRs? Is it with the the New Scale light water reactor technology that's kind of already proven out uh, in both submarine applications and also commercial reactors, or do you see other SMRs uh, potentially gaining ground? What's your thoughts on New Scale and and how they're leading this SMR approach? Well, I very much like what New Scale is doing. I think they're very innovative. I think they have excellent technology. New Scale has small modular reactors that are advanced reactors that are light water reactors that are pressurized water reactors. So they can work within much of the existing licensing knowledge at the NRC and customer knowledge of pressurized water reactors. Customers can phase in up to 12 modules to form one new scale plant, about 70 or so megawatts of electricity at a time per module and build up to a larger plant. And I think that the quicker construction time, the modular construction, the lower cost of the plant, substantially lower cost to build the plant is all needed. And I think that you'll see nuclear power in countries that wouldn't have imagined having it eventually because they'll be able to afford and deploy these small plants. As a pressurized water reactor, Lightbridge's fuel can work well, we believe, in a new scale plant. So that is the reason for our cooperation. And we 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 expect uh, very good things from New Scale. We expect in 2020 the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will grant the design certification for their reactor, and that the first will be built at Idaho National Laboratory. And I know they're looking at other potential orders in the U.S. and around the world, and they're really in the lead. There are other small modular reactors being developed that are also pressurized water or boiling water reactors, and then for the future, there are advanced types of reactors, not light water reactors, being developed that will take much longer. But I think New Scale's first, and I think New Scale has a first mover advantage, and I think they have an excellent product. Appreciate your information on that, Seth. And, and you, make, you make some good points about the affordability of this product uh, going forward if it is able to be commercialized. I think it's going to make sense for a lot of countries to look at that. Places like Puerto Rico uh, has a unique situation, remote locations for projects and remote communities, and also backup emergency powers is fantastic, really robust. So I think there's some good stuff going on. Can you talk to us a little bit about who might be fabricating the Lightbridge fuel, Seth? Uh, When do you see that coming out? And what degree will Lightbridge be controlling the supply chain for fuel, such as sources of uranium supply, conversion, and enrichment? Well, we've been working with one company in particular on on fabricating the fuel, and we're also um, looking at opportunities with U.S. national labs to participate now, and there'll be some more details on that coming out. But I'll say that the fabrication process for the Lightbridge fuel is something that in the end requires much less space and can be done much more quickly than how fuel is produced right now for reactors, where there are hundreds of pellets stacked in a tube to form a current fuel rod. The Lightbridge fuel uh, is a co-extruded metallic fuel using a process that Lightbridge invented uh, that produces the fuel rod in minutes, and then it needs to be true it needs to to be inspected etc but the initial production just take takes minutes and we believe we'll be able to produce this fuel much more quickly much more efficiently than than current nuclear fuel and where the fuel could be produced therefore has 
has some some added options, such as adding equipment at U.S. national labs, which now do not produce commercial nuclear fuel. And what is the lead time expectation if someone was to make an order for the fuel? What are you guys expecting uh, to get to get done as far as total lead time to get the fuel fabricated and delivered to the client? Uh, we expect definitely to be well within the commercial lead times in this industry, which is generally um, a few years that that, that uh, companies or that own utilities, uh, that own reactors are planning out their fuel orders. Uh, we'll, we'll be able definitely within the refueling times of, of reactors in the U.S. and around the world to be able to to produce and provide the fuel once we're commercialized. Very well. And for a, uh, can you speak to uh, the advantages, Seth, of the light bridge fuel technology uh, that they that you guys would hold um, as far as advantages over Westinghouse Encore fuel? And are maybe there's some drawbacks, or can you kind of compare and contrast the two technologies? Well, Encore is one of several technologies that come under the category of accident tolerant fuels. And after Fukushima, there was a U.S. government-led effort to develop fuels that in an accident scenario like Fukushima would not lead to a hydrogen gas explosions that you saw at Fukushima that blew up those buildings around the reactors. And what Westinghouse and other companies have been doing in very innovative ways is looking at ways to put different substances into the pellets in the fuel rods or coat the fuel rods with substances or make the rods that hold the pellets out of some, some different materials. And th this is, uh, you know, Encore and, and other approaches are now going through testing. And, and I think that they're, they're innovative, but I don't think they're going to provide all the benefits that people had hoped that they won't add what's called coping time quite as much as was hoped initially. Uh, on how long the, the fuel would hold up in an accident scenario. And mostly this industry under threat from low natural gas prices is looking for economic benefits for reactors. And I just don't see these accident tolerant fuels bringing major economic benefits. Now, the light bridge fuel brings what we think will prove out to be much more substantial safety benefits for the fuel, but also dramatic economic benefits that will allow the reactors to produce significantly more power, lowering the levelized cost of electricity, uh, being much more profitable for the utilities and competing against gas, against coal, against renewables. In fact, we we believe based on a study that was done by Siemens that the lowest cost electricity on the grid will be the added power from a reactor from switching to light bridge fuel. Seth, can you kind of expand a little bit on on the cost and life benefit of light bridge over conventional fuel? What what is the advantage? Why why would a utility come to light bridge and say this makes a lot of sense, sign us up? Well, for a new build pressurized water reactor, it looks like the light bridge fuel would add 30% more power by just using our fuel in the core of the reactor. Now, to take that power, you would have to have a larger turbine. You would have to have um, greater capacity of the con containment over the reactor, et cetera. Uh, so there'd be some costs to be able to take that extra power. But overall, it would still be a significant reduction to the capital costs of building the plants. You could build three plants and get just about the power of four with, with a 30% uprate per plant. For existing reactors, uh, it looks like we can do about a 17, 17% power uprate using our fuel. And again, that would mean uh, adjusting the reactor to be able to take, not the reactor, but the equipment around the reactor to take more power open the nozzle blocks and the turbine, et cetera. Um, for uh, utilities looking at the fuel, they also like the ability to lengthen the fuel cycle. So the reactor is shut down less often and is generating revenue by selling electricity more often by the fuel lasting longer and not having to shut it down as often to refuel it. 
And the utilities we're looking at are looking at a sweet spot where you're balanced between how long you would add days of running the reactor and how much power you would take to about a 10% power up rate from the reactor and lengthen a standard pressurized water reactor fuel cycle from 18 months to um, 24 months and run the reactor for two years between refuelings. So a 10% up rate and a 24-month fuel cycle is pretty much what we're looking at with most of the potential customers. Most of the reactors, let's say we're, we're using the fuel in existing reactors, is there any power increases that can be done within the current thresholds that are allowed under the regulations? Is that something that can be looked at now? You know, let's say you, you supply fuel to a reactor and they want to increase 5%. Is that within the current tolerances to where the utility does not have to make upgrades to existing equipment? Right. Just about every reactor has some margin available within it, and some of them through power up rates they've already done through through other means by optimizing the turbine, et cetera, have already taken some of the, the up rates within the margin that they have. But it looks like up to 10% can be done within the margin already existing in many of the plants around the world. Excellent. It's, it's something that can be used and uh, can immediately saw, saw the effects and, and the economic results of that. Now, can you speak just briefly to the temperature? Right. The hottest part of a nuclear fuel rod is down the center line of the fuel rod. And Lightbridge's fuel will run about a thousand degrees Celsius cooler than current fuel does down that center line of the fuel rod, about 1600 degrees Fahrenheit cooler. That is part of our safety advantage that this fuel is so much cooler in the reactor. And it's amazing, it's very brilliant technology how the fuel running so much cooler actually produces more power. And out at the edge of the fuel rod where it touches the water, the temperature is about the same as the current fuel rod. It's just not so piping hot down the middle. Our fuel has a much more uniform temperature throughout the rod, across it, and up and down the length of the rod than the current fuels do. There's much better what we call thermal conductivity heat transfer with the metal fuel versus a ceramic fuel. With the geometry of our fuel, there's a much shorter path for the heat to escape from the rod into the water. And we also have more surface area given the shape of our rods uh, that where the outer part of the rod touches the water uh, has greater surface area. And all of this combines uh, as part of the reasons why we have such a more efficient nuclear fuel. Well, Seth, for an average scenario, and I know, I know this is uh, estimates, Let's say a one gigawatt light water reactor. What would be the cost to use Lightbridge fuel against conventional fuel? And has the company established a price point that also provides enough incentive for utilities to make the fuel switch? Can you can you shed some light on that? Well, again, according to this independent study done by Siemens, uh, working with Worley Parsons, actually, it looks like the one-time cost to do everything to switch a large reactor over to use light bridge fuel would be about $85 million. And all of the work could be done within one refueling outage. So the reactor would not even be shut down one extra day. It wouldn't lose any revenue. The $85 million is a pretty low cost in the context of what utilities spend on nuclear fuel. And in fact, we think in less than three years, the economic benefits of the light bridge fuel would pay for that $85 million cost. So the internal rate of return on that $85 million is excellent. The utilities make that back pretty quickly and quickly become profitable from switching to, to this fuel is what's projected. And the fuel would then, say in a typical reactor, be producing 10% more electricity. The fuel would last longer in the reactor 24 months instead of 18 months. And the, the fuel itself um, would cost a little more than the current fuel if you just look at it, say, by a few per fuel rod basis, but per unit of electricity generated would be quite a bit lower cost. So overall, this would be a 
big economic improvement to the utilities. And the life extension, um, is that also in the power increase, is that also figured into this three-year payback? Yes. Okay. And can you go ahead and highlight for us, what are the plans in 2020, Seth? What's, what's the focus? Uh, what's the attack going to be? Um, and when do you see that you guys are going to be commercially available? In 2020, we'll be presenting to the public the first fuel rods that we've produced uh, up to full commercial length using surrogate materials, and we'll have videos of this. We believe we'll have our first contracts with U.S. government entities for doing work at U.S. national laboratories on testing the fuel in their reactors and in other facilities. We're very excited about the support the U.S. government in a bipartisan basis is bringing to advanced nuclear technologies and the work of the administration working with advanced nuclear companies, and we fully intend to be part of that. And we expect in 2020, Lightbridge will become a very well-known company in the advanced nuclear space. And can you give us a little bit of information? You know, I know we talked less than five years before. Do you think we will be at a point where the company will be substantially different by 2022, 2023? Or what do you see there on the commercial front? Well, commercially, for sure, yes. You'll see, um, you, you'll see the testing at a very advanced stage and demonstration in reactors at that point. The company itself, uh, I think, will look somewhat like it does today as a relatively small group of innovative people leveraging what we do with larger companies, with utilities, with U.S. government entities, with partners here and, and in other countries. I expect the company will look more or less the same, but I think the technology will be at a far, far more advanced position well along toward commercialization. And for potential investors who are on the sidelines, what would you say to them at this stage for the company at a current price level, Seth? Why should they look at Lightbridge now? Well, I think that if you look at Lightbridge now, you see just tremendous potential and tremendous progress. We're, we're in a world that will need to add more than one United States of electricity to global power generation in the next 20 years. We're going to need to do that in ways that produce no carbon or certainly a lot less carbon than the way we've been producing power in the world. And we see nothing that will be able to do that as efficiently and as scalable as Lightbridge is bringing to the marketplace. And Seth, how can in investors and other interested parties reach out to you and Lightbridge for more information? Well, you could always contact us at IR for investor relations, IR at ltbridge.com. And please go to our website, ltbridge.com, and look at the contact information, the phone numbers, the addresses. And we're always happy to, to talk to people about what we're doing here at Lightbridge. Seth, thank you for coming on and taking the time with us. We are looking forward to definitive progress at Lightbridge going forward. And we hope you'll come back again soon to update us. Thank you very much. I look forward to it. It's been a pleasure.